So welcome everybody and thanks, thanks for coming. We're, we're facing increasing vulnerabilities in terms of uh, resource depletion, climate change, the approaching uh, rising costs, increasingly rising costs of energy, and like any local community, we've got to take care of ourselves. And essentially, that's what economic localization is about. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. So we're going to the sort of uh, the main part of the evening. And uh, I'm going to call upon uh, Lanny Carter to introduce Dr. Porton. Welcome, everyone, to this long-awaited event. I foresee an exquisite synergy between what David Corton is going to say here today and how our favorite hometown can manifest itself in the next few years. Many of you, as I, have already read David's latest book, The Great Turning, From Empire to Earth Community. It's an amazing book, and I do not flatter. In this book, he lays down a challenge for those who can hear it. And without being preachy or self-righteous, he gives us the concepts, the tools, and most importantly, the positive rhetoric necessary to challenge and lead others in the great work of the great turning. Because each of you chose to be here tonight, each of you as individuals will take away a great deal. But I humbly ask you to consider a deeper level of engagement with what we're about to hear. Matthew Arnold, a great poet, once said, we are caught between two worlds, one dead and the other yearning to be born. The great turning shows us the fulcrum between those worlds and our relationship to it. All of us here tonight are not, I repeat, are not part of this fulcrum. We are way out at the far end of the teeter-totter, at the cutting edge of the park yearning to be born. So here's the crux of my introduction. David's book shows us that much of our work has to be in swinging the swing boat. His description of who and what constitutes this swing boat is nothing short of brilliant. In fact, it's crucial to our survival. I won't give you the nomenclature of this fulcrum, my word, or to this swing boat, his usage. But I'm sure David will do that. We here in Willits have the greatest collective opportunity of our lives just before us. We can take it upon ourselves to swing the swing boat right here. This, as I read the book, is the great turn. You as individuals have already made the great turn. How now can we as a town participate, perhaps even become a model for other towns in this great turn? We have two new city council members. I pray they become proactive in this leadership. This is, I believe, the great work for us as a community. I first found David Corton in an interview he gave to the Berkeley Monthly six or seven years ago. It was a great awakening for me because he was a thinker and a communicator who understood that it was our money system, the bedrock of American capitalism, and the global corporatism that, had take, that has taken it over, that was now threatening the future bloomings of democracy here and around the world. So I immediately went out and bought two of David's books, The Post-Corporate World and uh, When Corporations Rule the World, eye-opener both. His bio is high, wide, and deep, but what really piqued my interest and what makes his connection to our work here <coughs> in will it's so real and immediate, is the path that he's trod from his military service in Vietnam as a captain in the U.S. Air Force Headquarters Command and the Office of the Secretary of Defense, through his work with USAID in various countries, an organization which you know I work for in Vietnam, all the way to his becoming the co-founder and board chair of the Positive Futures Network, the founder and president of the People Center <laughs> Development Forum, and a board member of the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, Bali, of which our own Chamber of Commerce is a member. Thank what a path. Yeah. What a crossing. Many of us in our country are going to have to make this crossing if we are to survive. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, conservatives, liberals, 
Greens, Libertarians, Independents, <laughs> Socialists, and Capitalists, please give a wild and warm willing welcome to David. <laughs> filled in just since I sat down. This is an incredibly exciting evening for me. Uh, you know, I'm going around the country giving talks on the great turning, and essentially my goal is to get people everywhere around the country to do exactly what you're doing. Now, I'd heard about it. Uh, you know, Brian came up. He's been on a pilgrimage around the country, and he speaks pretty highly of what's going on down here. You know, this, uh, this is becoming known as the mecca of sustainability and, uh, and the local economies uh, movement. But, you know, in the back of my mind, you always got to wonder, you know, is, is he just a big blow-off, you know, telling us uh, all this stuff, or, or is it really going on? And, you know, it is instantly clear, it is for real. You guys have got it. Now, you know, one of the things that I've become very aware of over the years is that so often our, our progressive movements, our efforts to create a world that works for our children, families, communities, and nature, you know, we're going one by one, standing off the, the devastation from one assault after another. And we get so busy pulling babies out of the water, we forget to look upstream to see who's throwing them in. And we fail to realize that to get to the deeper source, get to the upstream problem, we've really got to come together. That, that it, most of our causes come together eventually as one deep underlying cause. And I'm hoping that, that the remarks that I will make tonight will help further cement what you're doing with even greater clarity on the deep significance of this initiative right here. You know, not just for our country, but for the human species. Because this is a fundamental time of choice, of decision for the human species. The underlying message of the great turning from empire to earth community is actually quite clear and simple. That we humans have come <clears throat> to the end of a long and deeply destructive era. And it is time to turn this world around, and it requires a deep cultural and institutional transformation. Because the moment that many of us have anticipated for several decades has arrived, we are now at that critical point of conjunction with the limits of the planet. Serious change is now inevitable, and business as usual is over. Now what this is going to do is shift the incentives in the direction that affirm and facilitate exactly what you're doing here. And as Brian noted, it's a combination of peak oil, climate change, a collapsing US dollar, and the social disintegration born of the marginalization of the major portion of humanity. All of these are poised to bring about this deep change. Now, how these forces play out will depend on the stories by which we humans understand what's happening to us and understand the choices that it's ours to make. You folks here are creating the new story, and I find hope in the fact that actually people throughout the United States and the world are meeting in dialogue to take a fresh look at the stories that we've lived by for too long. Individual discussions may focus on climate change, racism, peace, democracy, spiritual renewal, peak oil, any number of similar issues. But I call them Earth Community Dialogues because they converge on the same imperative, to create communities of place that recognize the interdependence of all life. Your work here, the meetings you've been having, are actually the models that Neva Welton, who works with me up on Bainbridge, that, that we have taken as the model for the kind of dialogue that we want to encourage around the country with your help. Now, I, want to, I find it useful sometimes to, uh, to start with a brief review of, uh, of some of the personal history that led me to the conclusions of the, uh, of the Great Turning. But first, a question. How many of here are over 60 years old? Oh, good. Our, our generation is well represented. <laughs> Members of our generation have lived through an extraordinary shrinking of geographical space and expansion of intercultural communication. This reflects a fundamental change in the human condition. 
that has spurred the awakening of a more holistic and inclusive human consciousness all around the planet and is opening the way to an epic reordering of human relationships with one another and Earth. My, my life experience is a dramatic example of this transition. For some of you who are younger, it may be useful to, to understand this as part of understanding the nature of our time. I grew up in a small conservative town in Washington State uh, where my family owned a music and appliance store. And in my town, I rarely saw a person of another race, and I never met a Hindu, Muslim, or Buddhist. And of course, you know, as typical of my generation, I assumed this was where I would spend, uh, spend my life, take over the family business, and sell musical instruments and home appliances to people who look very much like me and thought much like me. You know, for many of us at that point in our lives, it was unimaginable the kind of life experience I've had, where in fact, as an adult, I lived for 21 years outside of the United States, in East Africa, Central America, Southeast Asia, immersed in the wondrous diversity of Earth's peoples and cultures, and building close friendships that transcend the barriers of geography, nationality, race, and religion. Now, a particular turning in my life took place in 1959, when I was a college senior, actually, down, down here at, uh, at Stanford University nearby. And I was at that time a very conservative young Republican, and I was quite concerned about the threat that communist revolutions posed to our American way of life. So I, by chance, decided, well, I should take, there was a course on modern revolution in the catalog, and I thought, well, I'll take that and learn what this revolution thing is about. And of course, I learned that these revolutions were born of the frustrations of poverty. And lo and behold, that was, that was the critical turning point in my life when I decided, you know, instead of going back to Longview, I'm going to spend my life taking the lessons of U.S. business success out to the rest of the world so everybody else can be rich and happy and consumers like us and forget all this revolution nonsense. <laughs> now, many years later, I'm a slow learner. It took about 30 years to figure this out, but I came to the deeply disturbing conclusion that far from creating universal prosperity, the econo economic models that were favored by the institutions for which I worked were actually having devastating consequences for people on the planet. And I came to realize that these consequences were playing out not only in the countries where I was, but, but universally, including back here in the United States, Europe, and the countries that, uh, uh, that were supposed to be the models of advanced societies. As I reflected on it, the reasons in hindsight became quite clear. Those favored economic models called for decision making based on maximizing short-term returns to money rather than maximizing the long-term well-being of people and planet. And the more deeply I examined the issues, the clearer it became that these models primarily serve the interests of wealthy people in a position to profit from global corporations and financial markets. Eventually, some of our friends in Asia said, you know, we think we're, you're beginning to understand our problem. You came out here to help us. If you really want to help us, go home and work on education in your own country. And we eventually decided that was exactly what we must do. So in 1992, my wife Fran and I moved from the Philippines to New York City to focus our attention on the roots of the problem. We settled in an apartment on Union Square between Madison Avenue and Wall Street, which proved a suitably inspiring setting for writing when corporations rule the world. And that book, as many of you know, helped to frame the global resistance against corporate globalization, and it led to my deep personal involvement in the emergence of global civil society which I'll say more about. The Global Civil Society is kind of a generic name for that, uh, that global movement. Then on September 11, 2001, terrorists attacked the United States, and our government announced its intention to use the full force of the U.S. military to impose order on the world and secure U.S. interests. Pundits began talking about American empire, debating its merits. The veil was thus stripped away to reveal even more disturbing truths about the state of humankind, democracy, and the reality behind this idealized vision that the United States always acts in the world in a benevolent capacity, spreading democracy and, and benevolence to all. By its response to 9-11, the U.S. administration in power opened her eyes to the reality that the devastating dysfunctions of corporate rule are in fact but an extinction by other means of 5,000 years of domination by naked military force, the period we refer to as the era of empire. 
And to address this larger challenge, global civil society needed a larger framework, a larger analysis that went beyond simply our economic analysis. And my drive to understand the issues has involved me in a deep examination of the sweep of the human experience, our deep understanding of our human nature and of our human relationship to creation. The Great Turning is my report on this inquiry, and I hope it will help to frame the work of bringing an end to empire and birthing a new human era of Earth community. Now, the Great Turning begins with these prophetic words from the Earth Charter. We stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. To move forward, we must recognize that in the midst of a magnificent diversity of cultures and life forms, we are one human family and one Earth community with a common destiny. Now, the nature of the choice before us is between two contrasting models for organizing human affairs. One is the dominator model of empire, the other is the partnership model of Earth community. And I believe that absent an understanding of the history and implications of this choice, we humans could well squander valuable time and resources trying to fix institutions that cannot be fixed and must be replaced. Cultural historian Rhian Isler observes that for hundreds of thousands of years before the onset of empire, humans evolved within a cultural and institutional frame of Earth community expressed here in symbolic representation by the Stonehenge Circle of Life. These early ancestors worshipped the goddess, balanced feminine and masculine energies, and placed women in significant leadership roles. Generally peaceful and egalitarian, these societies organized not to dominate life, but to celebrate it. And it was a time of extraordinary creative progress in discovering and cultivating the capacities and technologies distinctive to the human species. These include the arts of spoken language, oral literature, settled agriculture, textile weaving, clothing production, metallurgy, town planning, architecture, building and highway construction, and the institutions of law, government, and religion. All of this accomplishment is largely ignored by those historians who would have us believe that human civilization began with empire and that empire and war are essential conditions of human progress. So here we are coming to be introduced to the stories of empire that hide from our vision the realities of our human possibility to live in cooperative relationship and pursue the creative progress of the species free from the destructive wars and competition of empire. It happened some 5,000 years ago that our ancestors made a tragic turn from the partnership of Earth community to the domination of empire, symbolized here by the Egyptian pyramids of power. Female gods were replaced by male gods, and we humans lost our attachment to Earth as the masculine drove out the feminine and men took over to rule by bow and sword. The resulting brutal competition for power created a relentless play-or-die, rule-or-be-ruled dynamic of violence and oppression as conquest became a measure of human greatness. Our societies became divided between the rulers and the ruled as relationships at all levels, from those among nations to those among family members, came to be organized by dominator hierarchy. Whole groups of people were eliminated from the competition for power and privilege simply by denying their humanity, specifically the humanity of women and people of color. And I'm sure those of you of my generation remember that it was within our lifetimes that there was still a serious debate as to whether women and people of color actually had human souls. I don't know if you younger people uh, were aware of that. It was not so long ago. Well, it turns out women and people of color have come forward and made, made damn well clear that they do have human souls and that they're actually stepping forward to assume the leadership and bringing forth a new, a new human era based on wholly different, uh, wholly different uh, values and ideas. This tragedy began in Mesopotamia, the land we call Iraq which means that empire has thus come full circle as this is the land in which the most powerful and hopefully the last human empire appears destined to exhaust itself. Turns out, it was quite surprising to me when I realized it, but it turns out it's no coincidence that every empire in human history has been built on a foundation of slavery and bonded labor. It's actually axiomatic. If you're going to have a society that has a few people on the top, most people are going to be on the bottom. And sweatshop and migrant agricultural workers are our modern equivalents. 
Thus it's been that for five millennia, the vast majority of humans have been reduced to conditions of servitude that deny their rights and suppress their creative potential. As at the same time, it has most often been the most power-driven and ethically challenged among us who have been elevated to the highest positions of power. Perhaps some of you can think of some contemporary examples of power-driven, <laughs> ethically challenged leaders. I'll give you a moment to think about that, boy. Hopefully we are making a little bit of a political shift in the United States. Now, to maintain this crime, crime against humanity, the agents of empire have systematically diverted a major portion of available resources <clears throat> away from meeting the people, needs of people and planet in order to support the military forces, prisons, palaces, temples, retainers, and propagandists required to maintain the system of domination. If any of you have seen Ben Cohen recently, the, uh, one of the founders of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, you probably have one of these pens here that, uh, that shows the comparison between our U.S. military budget and our social expenditures. Just, uh, just one contemporary example of, of this distortion of, uh, of priorities. Once you begin to understand these di dynamics, it becomes clear that most of the serious social dysfunctions of our time, including racism, sexism, environmental destruction, crime, war, and poverty, are all consequences of the inexorable rule or be ruled competitive dynamic of empire. And we may anticipate that they will continue to be with us for so long as we allow imperial cultures and institutions to define our values and relationships. This is what requires that progressive groups come together in common cause to deal with this deeper, uh, deeper source of our affliction. On a crowded planet, peace, Sustainability, justice, and equity are all inseparably linked. The time has come to choose a different path because empire has reached the limits of exploitation that people and planet will tolerate. If we continue with business as usual, future generations will look back and refer to our time as the great unraveling, a time of environmental and social collapse. Fortunately, it is within our means to move beyond empire to give birth to a new era of Earth community based on a more mature understanding of our responsibility to one another and to Earth. Buddhist spiritual teacher Joanna Macy suggests that if we are successful in navigating this transition, future generations may speak of this as the time of the great turning, the time when humanity turned from the way of domination and embraced the way of partnership. Now, over the millennium, the primary institutional form of empire has morphed from the imperial city-states of ancient time to the imperial nation-states of the modern era, and more recently to the imperial global corporations that now have more power than most nations. Throughout, however, as this morphing has taken place, the pattern of domination and exclusion has remained largely unchanged. Now, occasionally someone will ask me, why are you so obsessed with corporations? Aren't they just communities of people? Well, you may have noticed here that this argument misses a critical point. There are, of course, many wonderful ethical people working in, in publicly traded corporations trying to do the right thing. But the critical point is that in a publicly traded corporation, the people are all employees of the institution and have few, if any, individual rights within that institution. It is actually the money that has the rights that are protected. The people are paid to serve the institution at its pleasure, required to leave their personal values at the door, and subject to arbitrary dismissal without recourse at a moment's notice. These are not qualities that we normally associate with community. We're talking here about an institution of enormous power governed by absentee owners and unaccountable managers in the business of converting the life energy of people and nature into money for the short-term financial gain of already wealthy shareholders and managers without regard to human and natural consequences. In other words, we most accurately think of the publicly traded limited liability corporation as a gigantic pool of money with an artificial legal personality required by law to behave like a sociopath. <laughs> TR images aside, it is a destroyer of community and a powerful engine of wealth concentration in a world in desperate need of community and equity. And it has no place in a just and sustainable society. <clears throat> this is a key piece of what our work on rebuilding local economies is about, is to create economies 
based on local independent enterprises free from the pathology of this extreme form of absentee ownership. Now I want to turn to another uh, topic, another piece of the, of the great unraveling that was very key to my work abroad. Modern societies have for more than 50 years defined human progress in terms of economic growth. And we've been highly successful at growing our economies. Since 1950, economic output has increased by some seven times, and this has made a great deal of money for a few people. The other side of the story, however, is quite different. The Living Planet Index is a measure of the health of the world's freshwater, ocean, and forest ecosystems. This, of course, is the life support system of the planet, and arguably the measure of all real wealth. It's pretty straightforward. If there's no life support system, there's no life. And if there's no life, the whole concept of wealth loses any meaning. It's pretty straightforward. Now, this index of planetary health has declined by 37% of the past 30 years, which means that in spite of what GDP growth is telling us, we are in fact growing poorer as a species. So we get this one indicator that, that, that creates an illusion of prosperity, which draws our attention away from the reality. Now, the good news is that at least from the, uh, the good news, at least from the perspective of the planet, is that the species responsible for this devastation will be gone long before the index reaches zero. <laughs> now, another piece of this particular picture. About 85% of what remains of our planet's life support system is currently expropriated by the more fortunate 20% of the world's people to support often extravagantly wasteful lifestyles. Meanwhile, the poorest 20% struggle for survival on slightly more than 1%, and the middle 60% get by on roughly 14%. Now, one of the many lessons that I learned during my years abroad was that much of what we call development is actually a process of appropriating the land and water resources on which the bottom 80% of people depend for their livelihoods in order to make way for dams, mines, shrimp farms, agricultural estates, golf courses, suburban sprawl, shopping centers, etc., 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 primarily benefiting the already richest 20%. To put it in simple language, conventional economic growth indicators measure the rate at which the productive resources of the poor are being appropriated by the rich and converted to garbage. And this is what we call progress. As a process driven by the insatiable demands of a rising stock market, which inflates the financial assets of the rich to increase their claims against the usable wealth of the planet relative to the claims of people who live by returns to their labor. The result is an accelerating environmental devastation and growing economic inequality. Now, the day of reckoning for our reckless ways is now at hand. As we face the mounting forces of a perfect economic storm born of a convergence of peak oil, climate change, and a U.S. meltdown, U.S. dollar meltdown. Now, I'm sure you people are quite familiar with these things now because Brian lectures on them regularly, but I'm going to run you through just a quick summary so we see how these pieces fit together. Peak oil occurs when global oil production peaks and begins its inexorable decline as continued rising demand sends prices soaring. Some experts say that oil output may have peaked last year in 2005. Others argue it will not peak for another 10, 20, or even 35 years. Fortune magazine correctly notes that the difference is irrelevant. The, cheap, the era of cheap oil is over, and we must act immediately to eliminate our oil dependence. Here are some implications for how our way of life will change. Long-haul transport and global supply chains, the backbone of the global economy, relics of a dying era. Auto-dependent suburbia, strip malls, shopping centers, and box stores like Walmart located in the middle of nowhere. Candidates for going out of business sales. Oil-dependent industrial agriculture, running out of gas. Now, take a close look here. Do you see any oil dependence? <laughs> These, of course, are the oil-guzzling military planes, ships, and ground vehicles we depend on to secure our access to cheap oil. They're increasingly unaffordable, and as demonstrated most recently in Afghanistan and Iraq, they are wholly ineffective against current security threats. Indeed, as we see, they're actively counterproductive. Now, as oil prices inexorably rise, much of our existing capital stock will, will be reduced to useless stranded assets, including much of the supporting infrastructure of our sprawling and unsustainable suburbs. 
Options for converting existing automobiles to other power sources may be limited, although this is one biofuel prototype currently <laughs> under testing. <laughs> There's hope. There's hope. Now the consequences of peak oil will be exacerbated by climate change. During the 20th century, the average mean surface temperature of the planet increased by 0.6 degrees Celsius. Projections of the increase anticipated by the end of the current century range from 2 degrees to 4.5 degrees Celsius. We're already experiencing an ominous trend in weather-related natural disasters from the decade of the 1950s to the first five years of the 21st century, and that would be within the lifetimes of most of us in this room, the annual average of weather-related natural disasters increased from 24 per year to 350 per year. Hurricanes Katrina and Rita are, a foretaste, are but a foretaste of what lies ahead. According to a, a study commissioned by the U.S. Department of Defense, we can expect shorter growing seasons and a 10 to 25 percent global loss of crop yield. Water shortages, increase in forest fires, famine, disease, and severe weather events, endemic resource wars, and uncontrolled migration. The threat of terrorism pales by comparison. Now we come to the third element of the perfect economic storm, a meltdown of the U.S. dollar, which is a consequence of a growing U.S. trade deficit that hit three-quarters of a trillion dollars in 2005 and growing as empty shipping containers accumulate in our busy ports. A growth in the trade gap between what we import and what we export is a measure of the extent to which we in the United States are living ever further beyond our own means, running up a credit card debt to the rest of the world, and leaving the bill to our children. It is also a measure of the rate at which we are hemorrhaging both the family wage jobs that created the U.S. middle class and the manufacturing technology and research capabilities that go with these jobs. And on the day the rest of the world tires of selling on credit to an economic deadbeat, the financial house of cards that supports our profligate ways will collapse. Now if we choose to allow the great unraveling to play out by the rules of empire as a last man standing competition for the remaining resources of the planet, we can anticipate escalating military conflict and terrorism leading to feudal fragmentation as after the fall of the Roman Empire and possible nuclear Armageddon. Fortunately, there is an alternative. And I expect by now you may be eager to hear me talk about it. <laughs> the perfect economic storm will force a dramatic restructuring of the way we live as the economic incentives shift from global to local supply chains and from suburban sprawl to compact communities that bring home, work, and recreation in easy reach by foot, bicycle, and public transit. Now, as these forces play out, the communities that fare best will be those that act now to rebuild local supply chains, reverse the trend toward conversion of farm and forest lands, concentrate population in urban cores, support local low-input family farms, and seek to become substantially self-reliant in food and energy. You'll note here this aligns exactly with what you people are currently engaged in doing. This is where the opportunity comes, because this imperative thus becomes an opportunity to rebuild functioning communities, restore a sense of place, democratize economic power, and radically revise our human priorities for the use of labor, land, and other natural resources. Hey, great work, guys. Great work. Now I want to turn to a story by one of my favorite biologists. It's the story of the metamorphosis of the caterpillar to the butterfly as told by evolution biologist Elizabeth Satoris. I believe it provides a helpful metaphor for the human turning from empire to earth community. The caterpillar is a voracious consumer that devotes its life to gorging on nature's bounty. When it's had its fill, it fastens itself to a convenient twig and wraps itself in a chrysalis to take a rest. Once it's snug inside, however, a crisis strikes as the structures of its cellular tissue begin to dissolve into an organic soup. Now note, this represents disaster from the perspective of the caterpillar's lower worm nature. But it represents opportunity from the perspective of its higher butterfly nature. Woo! <laughs> now guided by some deep inner wisdom, a number of what scientists call organizer cells. I want you to repeat that. 
organizer cells. Keep that in mind. Yeah. The organizer cells begin to rush around gathering other cells into imaginal buds, multicellular structures that begin to form the crucial organs of a new creature. You get the drift here? <laughs> get the drift? Now, correctly perceiving a threat to the old order, the caterpillar's still intact immune system attributes the threat to the imaginal buds and attacks them as alien intruders. That can happen. But the imaginal buds ultimately prevail by linking up with one another in a cooperative emergent process that gives birth to a new creature of extraordinary beauty that lives lightly on the earth, serves the regeneration of life by pollinating flowers, and in its rebirth has the capacity to traverse vast expanses of the North American continent to experience life's possibilities in ways the earthbound caterpillar could scarcely have imagined. Hey! Now, as our familiar institutional structures disintegrate around us, we humans stand on the threshold of a rebirth no less dramatic. The transformation of the caterpillar is physical. The successful, ours will be cultural and spiritual. And whereas the caterpillar faces an outcome preordained by the experience of countless generations before and deeply embedded in its genetic structure, we humans are path-breaking pioneers in uncharted territory. Our success depends on exercising our human capacity for conscious, creative, collective choice. Now here's one of these extraordinary coincidences. We humans have achieved the means to assume collective responsibility for our future at the precise moment we have encountered the imperative to do so. And I take this as evidence that creation is indeed intelligent, compassionate, and wants the human species to succeed. Consider. It was little more than 60 years ago that we created the United Nations, for which, which for all its imperfections made it possible for the first time in the human experience for representatives of all the world's peoples to meet in a neutral space to resolve their differences through dialogue rather than through force of arms. It was less than 50 years ago that we ventured into space to look back and see ourselves as one people sharing a common destiny on a living spaceship. And it was only within the last 10 to 15 years that our communications technologies gave us for the first time the ability, should we choose to use it, to link every human on the planet into a seamless web of nearly costless communication and cooperation. And this all happened in the span of a single lifetime. Our future will now be determined by how we choose as a species to use the capabilities now in our hands. Unfortunately, there are a few barriers. Our ability as a society to choose life is seriously hampered by the work of a small group of committed right-wing extremists who believe that the strength of America lies not in a strong middle class and vibrant local communities, but rather in a strong, wealthy, ruling elite and the global projection of corporate and military power. These extremists claimed to be conservative defenders of family values. But in fact, they cut programs that benefit children, families, communities, and nature in order to finance tax cuts for the very rich, subsidies to crony corporation, and wars of imperial domination and occupation that actively undermine peace, security, and democracy. These acts are wholly at odds with what most Americans understand to be conservative values, and they constitute an all-out war against our children, families, communities, and nature. Now perhaps somebody in here has at some time wondered how these self-serving champions of corporate greed could obtain the willing participation of so many among us in destroying so many of the things we most value. Has that a question occurred to anybody here? I think there's a simple but profound answer. And that answer is a key to the turning. We humans live by the stories that define our values and our understanding of our relationships with one another in creation. Authentic cultural stories are told by authentic storytellers and artists engaged in interpreting the values and aspirations of authentic communities. In our society, unfortunately, 
Much of the storytelling function has been taken over by propagandists and advertisers on the payrolls of imperial politicians and corporations in order to create a cultural trance that blinds us to our higher possibilities. <laughs> Just keep your eyes focused on the spinning circle up here, ladies and gentlemen, and don't pay any attention to what else is going on around you. Now this misdirection plays out in the prevailing stories that define the public discourse on prosperity, security, and meaning. Now listen closely and consider how each of the familiar stories reaffirm empire's relations of domination. The imperial prosperity story says, economic growth is a true measure of increasing prosperity and brings benefit to all. Economic growth requires wealthy investors able to finance the enterprises that create our jobs. And as investors seek to maximize their individual financial gain, the invisible hand of the market rewards each according to their contribution to the prosperity of all. Therefore, for the good of society, we must free wealthy people from the taxes and regulations that limit their ability to accumulate the substantial fortunes essential to our well-being. We must also eliminate those horrible welfare programs that hold the poor in poverty by stripping them of the incentive and motivation to be productive members of society willing to take whatever jobs the market offers. Hey! Anybody ever hear this story? You know, we hear these stories so regularly, they just kind of come into the background and it's easy to just slip into not recognizing them for what they are. An intentional effort to maintain a cultural trance. Now the beautiful thing is, all we have to do is go through it once and I'm sure every time you hear any element of the story in the future, you will immediately recognize it for what it is and if it ever had any power over you, it will no longer. Then there's the imperial security story. It tells of a dangerous world filled with criminals, terrorists, and foreign enemies. Our security depends absolutely on the aggressive use of strong police and military forces to control and eliminate unruly elements. Probably heard that story sometime too, and not too long ago. Now, the, the next story is a little bit harder for some of us because it goes so deeply into the things that, uh, that many of us have grown up to believe. <clears throat> The imperial meaning story tells of a god who commands us to go forth to establish dominion over the earth. The god who favors the righteous with wealth and power and commissions his favor to rule over the poor who justly suffer divine punishment for their sins. We may not know what those sins were, but they must indeed have been horrendous. Meaning is found in obedience to God and to his appointed representatives. You see the pattern in these stories. Each of these imperial stories affirm the legitimacy of economic inequality, the use of physical force to impose the will of rulers, and the special righteousness of the rich and powerful. Together, these are three of the primary stories that hold us in the cultural trance and maintain the legitimacy of illegitimate regimes. Now although it may seem absurdly simple, the key to changing the course of the human future is to change the stories by which we live. And it begins by finding the courage to break the silence and speak openly the truth in our hearts as we reach out to find one another and end our isolation by forming communities of congruence that link and grow. So together we can speak with a clear and audible voice to change the prevailing cultural stories, liberate the higher orders of human consciousness, and turn the human course. Now contemporary scientific findings point to a profound yet elegantly simple insight that appropriately frames the stories that is ours to tell. Relationships are the foundation of everything. Now whereas Newtonian physics was based on a premise that only the material is real, the new quantum physics suggests that the material is but an illusion. Only relationships are real. The new biology teaches that by the very nature of the way life manages energy, life can only exist in living cooperative communities. And psychologists tell us that healthy relationships are the key to achieving immature human consciousness. Put it together. 
True prosperity, security, and meaning are found in the life of just, vibrant, cooperatively interlinked communities that support every person in realizing their full creative potential. Exactly what you're doing here in Willits. It is up to us to assume the role of organized ourselves, engaged in the great work of forming the cultural and imaginal institutional imaginal buds of a new era of Earth community. It requires breaking free from the cultural trance of some of our most treasured stories. I don't know whether you've gotten into this one, but this is one example. The story that the founding fathers of our nation acted out of a passionate belief in the right of every person to life, liberty, and justice, and gave us governing institutions that embody the highest expressions of the democratic ideal. Now, as we go forward, it's important to realize and give credit where it's due. The founding fathers did make important groundbreaking contributions on the path to democracy in their time, specifically by bringing an end to hereditary monarchy and introducing the separation of church and state to bring an end to theocracy, religious political rule. Beyond that, however, much of our cherished national story is in fact a self-limiting myth that serves elite interest by denying the need for continuing struggle in pursuit of the democratic ideal. Consider the following well-known facts. Our Constitution was written by white male landowners. Read it carefully within the context of its time, and it is clear it was written to enshrine their power in the institutions, not of a democracy, but a plutocracy, a system of rule by people of wealth. As we well know, every, land, every inch of the land we occupy was taken by force and deceit from Native Americans, and much of that land was worked by slaves. And women did not get the vote until 1920. Now, even with the progress achieved through two centuries of popular struggle, daily events demonstrate to anyone who is paying attention that to this day, our nation is ruled as a plutocracy by people of wealth, many of whom are disdainful of the de democratic idea that ordinary people have both the right and the capacity to govern themselves. In the words of Francis Moore LePay, to save the democracy we thought we had, we must take democracy to where it has never been. Democracy remains an unfinished project. Now the work of actualizing the democratic ideal calls us to bring forth the living economies, living democracies, and living cultures of a new era of Earth community. The success of this work of bringing forth the living economies, living democracies, and living cultures of a new era will turn on our ability to displace the prevailing stories that affirm the dominator relationships of empire with stories that celebrate the higher order possibilities and potential of Earth community. The living economy stories celebrate life as the measure of true prosperity and call for the locally rooted equitable distribution of ownership rights to productive assets in order to secure the right of every person to a secure and fulfilling means of living. This is the core work of the economic turning. If our children, families, communities, and natural systems are healthy, then we are prosperous. Whether conventional indicator, economic indicators such as GDP and stock indices rise or fall should be irrelevant in a properly designed economy. It is time to give priority to the things that matter and to measure what matters and forget about that which does not. Now, cities and towns all across the United States and Canada are taking on the challenge of creating new economies of Earth community through the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, just as you're doing here. One of the things that's so exciting, I believe yours is the first Chamber of Commerce to actually join up. Uh, <laughs> leaving the forces of the dark side to join the forces of the light. Founded in 2002, Bali now has 35 local networks and some 11,000 members throughout the United States and Canada, all working to create a new, grow a new planetary system of local living economies. Living democracy stories. These celebrate the active civic engagement and grounded in a deep sense of mutual caring and responsibility. And they call for fair and open political processes based on public financing of elections instant runoff voting, and proportional representation. This is the core of our political turning work. It is our choice. We can focus on expanding the middle class and strengthening community to increase prosperity, security, and liberty for all, 
or we can focus on growing corporate profits and the financial assets of an elite class to increase the tyranny and insecurity of empire. The one advances democracy, the other plutocracy. Then there are the living culture stories that celebrate the wonder and beauty of creation, life, and the creative potential of the human species. Nurture the higher orders of spiritual consciousness and call for turning the institutions of religion, education, and media to the service of free and authentic cultural expression in the surface of creation's continuing journey. This is the core of our cultural turning work. I consider it one of the great tragedies of Western culture. that We of Western societies have been conditioned by our religion stories to believe that we are fallen sinners incapable of goodness and unworthy of salvation except by divine grace. We've similarly been conditioned by science stories of Darwinian competition, selfish genes, and economic man to believe that it is our human nature to be individualistic competitors and profligate consumers. Now by either reckoning, the very idea that we might choose to live by the principles of Earth community would have to be logically dismissed as contrary to our nature. Again, however, these stories that affirm empire by denying the positive potentials of our nature are false. The true story comes from psychologists who study the developmental pathway of the human consciousness. These psychologists report that those of us who enjoy the requisite emotional support from family and community traverse throughout our lifetimes the pathway from the undifferentiated, instant gratification-seeking, self-referential consciousness of the newborn to the highly differentiated, timeless, and inclusive spiritual consciousness of the wise elders. Our nature? We are a choice-making species of many possibilities and it is within our means to choose to cultivate the potentials of the spiritual consciousness that the cultures and institutions of empire deny. I come to believe through my life that real meaning comes from approaching life as a journey of discovery, devoted to actualizing the higher possibilities of our individual and collective nature. And growing millions of people around the planet are choosing this path. Millions are experiencing an awakening of the higher orders of possibility of the human consciousness. This awakening is perhaps manifest most visibly in the newly emergent social phenomenon we call global civil society. A planetary scale, self-organizing social organism that transcends the barriers of race, class, religion, and nationality to act as a shared conscience of the species. Committed to a global vision of peace and justice, global civil society took form initially in opposition to the destructive consequences of corporate globalization. Then on February 15, 2003, it brought more than 10 million people to the streets of the world, cities and towns to oppose the violence of the planned U.S. invasion of Iraq. Think about what this, what this represented. It was a phenomenal act of self-organization, unprecedented in the human experience. Because it was accomplished without the benefit of any central organization, there was no operating budget, there was not even a charismatic leader standing up and saying, follow me. It was the work of millions of citizen leaders all around the world acting out of a shared sense of values, and a shared vision of the world that they wanted. And it could not have happened at any prior time. It couldn't have happened even 10 years earlier, prior to the creation of the widespread use of the internet. It is but a foretaste of the possibilities of the truly democratic societies, free from the tyranny of dominator structures that it is ours to create. At Yes Magazine, we call it a conspiracy of hope. Now I bet there's somebody out here asking another question. What hope can there be for building a consensus commitment to Earth community in our politically divided nation? Has that question occurred to anybody here? <coughs> there is a hopeful answer. For all the talk of red states and blue states, U.S. polling data reveal a startling degree of consensus on many key issues. The truth is we are more purple than we realize. A poll last December reported that 90% of us agree that big companies have too much power. I think that's a start for a good conversation. 
83% of us believe that as a society, the United States is focused on the wrong priorities. Super majorities of more than 80% want to give higher priority to the needs of children, family, community, and the natural environment. In other words, Americans want a world that put people ahead of profits, spiritual values ahead of financial values, and international cooperation ahead of international domination. Now I want you to note something. None of these values can be identified as distinctively either conservative or distinctively liberal values. They are universal human values. We are, in fact, one nation yearning for healthy children, families, communities, and natural environments. So I want to see some hands here. Do you think big business has too much power? Anybody in the room here? <clears throat> okay. I didn't see all the hands. You're sure we got all the <laughs> How many think big business doesn't have enough power? <clears throat> okay. Well, I guess we got that one clear. <clears throat> How many of you think we're focused as a nation on the wrong priorities? Okay, that looks like a pretty good consensus. Um, how many yearn to see more, uh, more priority given to the needs of children, family, community, and nature? Wow. And I bet that some of you came in here believing that you were members of a fringe minority. <laughs> in fact, we are the leading edge of a national supermajority, and it is appropriate for us to speak and act accordingly with clarity and confidence. Hey! This is a defining moment. We humans face an unprecedented choice. Give up the reckless ways of our species adolescence and accept responsibility for one another and Earth, or continue on a pathway to collective suicide. In its profound wisdom, the spiritual force of creation is calling us to take the step to a new level of species maturity. The new biology makes the case that the species that succeed and thrive are not, in fact, the most brutal and competitive. Rather, they are the species that find their place of service to the whole. This is the challenge now before our species to find our place of service in the larger scheme of creation. I think of it as a final examination to determine whether we are a species worthy of survival. And a passing grade will require a sweeping cultural and institutional transformation. Now, some of you have likely noticed, we wait at our peril for the leadership in this great work to come from within the institutions of empire. They are the equivalent of the caterpillar's immune system. By design, the institutions of empire serve the interests of elite power. Their time is passing. We are experiencing the thrashing of their death throes. The recent elections may help. They may slow the damage. But the real leadership in the great turning must come from people like us, acting as organizer cells of a new era, working through our local businesses, governments, churches, educational and institutional and uh, institutions and civic organizations to build vital democratic communities that serve as the imaginal buds of a new era. This is the work you are doing here in Willits, and this is why it's so important. Because wherever we live, we must each engage the challenge of making our particular community of place an inspiring model of what can be for the nation and the world. And as these experiments spring up across the nation, across North America, around the world, we'll learn together, we will share, we will create together as we change the national conversation and ultimately turn the human course. In summary, break the silence, end the isolation, act through word and deed to break the trance, change the story, and turn this world around. I hope you'll get a copy of The Great Turning from Empire to Earth Community and use it as a resource for personal study and for engaging your friends and colleagues and discussing the great work of our time. Think of it in some ways as a handbook for learning to identify the stories of empire on the path to breaking the cultural trance. If you have an organization, I suggest you think about framing its mission in terms of the particular story in the larger society that you're working to change. Because by changing the story, that everything else follows. Check out thegreatturning.net for group discussion guides and other helpful resources in this work. And if you're not already a Yes subscriber, I urge you to act at once to correct this obvious deficiency in your life. <laughs> 
they're Yes magazines, I think, for everybody out, uh, outside as you, as you leave. We created Yes to change the story that there is no alternative to empire. And it's filled with inspiring stories of people doing the work that, you, that you're doing here. Our very next issue is on going local, about building local economies. Uh, start a Yes discussion circle, find it all at yesmagazine.org. Our distinctive human capacity for reflection and intentional choice carries a corresponding moral responsibility to care for one another and Earth. And we must now test the limits of the individual and collective creative potential of our species as we strive to become the change we seek. And in these turbulent and often frightening times, it is important to regularly remind ourselves that we are privileged to live at the most exciting moment of creative opportunity in the whole of the human experience. We can turn from empire to earth community. It is ours to choose. The future is in our hands. Now is the hour. We have the power to turn this world around. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you.